everybody. Welcome to the fifth CBP Nonprofit Research uh, Publication Overview. Uh, if you've been following these, you, you know that I've been giving a history and overview of chiropractic biophysics nonprofit research publications. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Deed Harrison. I'm the president of Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit and president of Chiropractic Biophysics Seminars and Technique. The two are separate entities, even though I am president of both of them. Uh, the nonprofit one, it's an elected position, and uh, so far I'm in good status and standing as my presidency. And uh, I think we're doing a great job with our research. Uh, to date, we've uh, published just over 150 peer-reviewed research publications, and uh, shown on this particular slide is a list of some of the journals that we've been in and uh, the majority of our papers. Not all of them are uh, indicated on this particular slide. Uh, this week, what we're going through is our fifth publication uh, in 1996. Now, this is not number five in consecutive order. Uh, however, this is, you know, still in our first 10 research projects. What I'm doing is I'm kind of skipping around just a little bit. I'll pick up the ones that I, I missed that actually predated this particular project. However, I'd like to go through this one because it ties in uh, to what uh, the last couple projects that we've just been doing together. Uh, this particular one is one of our most famous research projects. It's perhaps been one of the most cited research projects that we've done. Uh, this was the C CBP cervical spinal model validation paper or a, a paper to, to see can we validate the concept of the cervical curve being approximated by a piece of a circle. This comes from Spine 1996 in the March issue. Uh, this was done by my late father, Dr. Don Harrison uh, and Dr. Tad Yonick, his PhD advisor. Uh, Dr. Steve Tronovich, a former CBP instructor, and Dr. Bert Holland, our uh, PhD in uh, statistics uh, from Temple University. Unfortunately, my father and uh, Bert Holland are now passed away. Uh, however, uh, this is a great particular project for us to be going through here. Uh, we've discussed our spine model being a height over length ratio, and we've discussed the 95% uh, height over length index from Delmas. And we've discussed the fact that the CBP model should approximate or is a piece of a circle and the cervical curve should be approximated by that. Now our model is really a simple geometric model that represents the path of the posterior longitudinal ligament in the sagittal plane. Our model runs from C2 down to T1. And we say C2 because there's no PLL at C1 because there's no uh, posterior body. However, we do have the tectorial membrane up in that region that is an extension of the PLL. So you can say that that is the path of our model along the back of the dens, if you will. Okay, so the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies uh, from C2 all the way down to T1. Uh, we make the measurements, and we've talked about these in previous papers. We've investigated the reliability of these lines. ARA is the total angle of curve uh, from C2 to C7 and the RRAs, relative rotation angles, are the segmental angles from C2 to C7. Now, the RRAs have to add up to the ARA, right? So we use that as a, a, a test or a check, if you will. The segmental pieces have to add up to the total angle of curve. In this particular project, Spine 1996, we are designing a paper to see, A, can we assess a patient population, or excuse me, a normal population uh, of subjects with their sagittal plane curve accurately enough to compare them to our theoretical cervical model using the Delmas index. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, x-rays of 400 subjects. We are going to hand measure those x-rays using the RRAs and ARAs. We're also going to look at the atlas plane line and we're going to look at translation of C2 to C7. And we're going to do a special measurement that runs along the posterior bodies or the posterior longitudinal ligament. This way we can get a height over length index. So we can get the height of the column from C2 to 
to C7 or C1 to T1, and then we can get the length of the curve using a drafting tool that is very, very accurate to one-tenth of a millimeter that goes along the posterior aspect of the vertebral body margins. So we're going to look at what is the average height over length ratio of these, 40, uh, of these 400 subjects. We're going to look at what is their segmental and total angle of curve. And then we're going to take this information and we're going to plug that into our cervical spine model, which is simply a, a computer code that's a Fortran equation. And we're going to put a subject's height over length index into our model and we're going to see what those segmental angles should be. So we're going to have a model prediction and then we're going to have a hand-drawn measurement and we're going to compare the two to see can the model accurately predict what we've identified in the subjects. And that is a form of validation. If the model, if you give it a height to length index and it spits out numbers, that are based on certain criteria that we'll, we, we'll talk about. If that model is accurate to what we actually measure in those subjects, then we can say this is a valid model within certain limits. Now, the exclusion criteria are important in this project. Many people have misunderstood the study design. This is a retrospective sample of 400 subjects. We excluded any subject that had segmental or total cervical kyphosis. Why? Because we're only looking at a model of what a lordotic neck looks like. By nature, cervical kyphosis is abnormal, so we excluded that from our population. Any segmental or any total kyphosis, you are not in this paper. Only people with lordotic cervical curves are in this project, 400 of them. We also in excluded moderate to severe degenerative joint disease because that will affect the, the amount of cervical curve. Okay? We also excluded anomalies and fractures, things like that. So this is our population. Now, out of 400 subjects, only 252 of them were quote unquote asymptomatic subjects. So we'll see in later uh, slides coming up, we'll, we'll see the breakdown of the the total population, we'll look at the sex distribution, is there a gender difference, and then we'll look at is there a difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic. First, what I would like to do is provide evidence to support our exclusion criteria of segmental and total kyphosis. This project, when you look at the data, we found a, a higher magnitude of cervical lordosis than typically reported in the literature. And it's because we excluded kyphotic necks, straight necks, and segmental kyphosis. Only lordotic subjects were included in the population. So people asked us, why'd you do that? Our rationale was cervical kyphosis is abnormal just by name. By the name! You can look it up in Gray's Anatomy. The cervical curve is supposed to be lordotic, right? So by name, a kyphosis is abnormal. However, what we can do is we can look at studies in the literature from the past up until recent times to show that segmental kyphosis is indeed abnormal. And this particular one comes from 1999. Yes, it's after our 96 paper, but I thought I'd throw it in there for you uh, regardless. Journal of Spinal Disorders by Kawakami et al. What they did is they looked at 60 patients that were treated for myelopathy with um, cervical anterior spinal uh, fusion. And they followed these people for long-term outcomes. What they identified is local kyphosis at the segmental fusion and narrowing of the neural foramen were actually predictive of subjects that had post-axial symptoms, post-surgical axial symptoms. Now, axial symptoms are non-radicular. So they go in for radiculopathy, and that's better after surgery, but now they have neck pain, upper back pain, shoulder pain, and they have uh, suboccipital headache pain. These are axial symptoms. Why? The Kawakami paper said it's, it's due to the alignment of the fusion being in segmental kyphosis. That's what they discuss in this project. Furthermore, 2001, Katsura came out in the European Spine Journal. What they identified is post-surgically in a long-term follow-up, 77% of the kyphotic segments that were fused in kyphotic at long-term follow-up, these are the ones that degenerated. 
right? So if you're fused in a kyphotic alignment, segmental or total, now due to Wolf's Law, a project we just discussed in the fourth research paper that we just did, we know that that's going to create altered and increased mechanical load and accelerate degenerative joint disease. Well, this paper in 2001 found that very thing. Long-term follow-up post-surgically, if you have a fused segment in kyphosis, you will degenerate 77% of the time in this particular project at long-term follow-up. More recently, the Faldini paper. This comes from uh, orthopedic uh, or clinical orthopedics and related, related research in 2001. This is a great paper. This is a 10-year follow-up of 107 patients uh, with disc herniation and degenerative joint disease at one level. They did a discectomy and a one-level fusion, and then they followed them for a minimum of 10 years to identify what are the predictors of ASDD. ASD is adjacent segment degenerative disease, right? or a degenerative disc. Here's what they identified. Post-operative sagittal segmental alignment was correlated to degenerative joint disease at the adjacent segment. More specifically, for each degree of lordosis at the fusion, there was a 20% reduced risk of adjacent level degeneration at 10-year follow-up. This is a huge finding. For each degree of fused lordosis at that segment, that reduces your risk of degeneration above that fusion by 20%. Here's what they identified. The amount of segmental lordosis in their non-degenerative group at 10-year follow-up is shown on the left, and the uh, amount of segmental lordosis in the degenerative group is shown on the right. So we know that segmental alignment fused in lordosis protects from adjacent segment disease or degenerative disease post-surgically. Those three papers validate one of our exclusion criteria in our SPINE 1996 project. I like to go through it that way so you, you understand the rationale for why we did what we did in this particular project. Now back to uh, <clears throat> our paper here. These are the assumptions that are generated or that generate our cervical spine model. We, when we build a model of anything, you have to have major and minor assumptions. So our cervical model, we have major and minor assumptions, and I've broken them down into six assumptions. Number one, the cervical lordosis is a circular arc. We need to test that. This is part of the, the assumption of the model. It is a piece of a circle along C2 to C7. The cervical lordosis extends actually from C1 to the inferior body corner of T1, okay? C1 to T1. The thoracic vertebra number one is actually a transition or inflection point between the two curves. The superior half of T1 looks like the cervical segments. The inferior half of T1 kind of looks like or does look like the thoracic segments when you look at the an anatomy of it. So our, one of our assumptions is the whole curve C1 to T1 but we'll likely find out that C2 to C7 in later projects is a little bit better model. The cervical disc to vertebral body ratio, in other words, the height of the disc relative to the vertebral body, we have to have an assumption of their height ratio based on the way we draw our lines. Okay? We do posterior body tangent lines that are tangent at mid-body, so we need to understand how tall the disc is relative to the vertebra because that's going to influence how big our segmental angles are going to be. So we identified in the literature that the disc to body ratio is approximately 40% or two to five. So the disc is 40% of the height of the vertebral body. And then number four, compared with the height of the other cervical vertebra, this means C3 to C7, the C2 vertebra is larger and it's worth an extra disc height, okay? We know C2 is a bigger bone, how much larger it is, this is what we had to approximate or estimate in our model. So we looked at it logically and anatomically in papers and we said, well, there's no disc from C1 to C2, so the C2 vertebral body theoretically is about the, the height increase of an extra disc. In other words, it's 40% larger than the other vertebra. We'll see how that assumption came out. 
The line through the atlas vertebra used to measure the atlas inclination horizontal is drawn through mid-atlas lateral mass. That's, even though it's a minor assumption, it's an important assumption. It's the way we make our measurement. The model has to use that information to give me an atlas plane line. Okay? And then number six, I alluded to this, lines drawn along the posterior vertebral body margins are actually tangent at mid-body. Tangent at mid-body. Right? This is important in how we calculate and make the seg segmental measurement angles. So here's our mathematical model. It's a simple Fortran equation. Height over length equals sine theta divided by theta. And to put that in terms you can likely understand is it breaks down into eight vertebra, that's x, plus seven times two fifths, two fifths x. This is my discs. I have seven discs. They're two-fifths the size of the vertebral body. So I have eight vertebra, that's x. I have seven discs that are uh, two-fifths the height of the vertebral body equals my total arc angle, angle two theta. Okay? These are the uh, measurements we're interested in here. We're interested in the atlas plane line to horizontal. We're interested in C2 to C7, uh, absolute rotation angle. And then we're interested in all the relative rotation angles that are tangent at mid-body. And then here's our total arc angle, uh, 2 theta. So again, 8x plus 7 times 2 fifth x equals the total arc angle, 2 theta. That's our simple mathematical model. Now, if you put in the height over length ratio, of any amount, let's say I put in the ideal Delmas index of 95%, that model will spit you out numbers of all the relative rotation angles and the uh, absolute rotation angle. It'll spit you out the atlas plane line as well. Now built into it is the C2 vertebra is 40% larger than the rest of the vertebra, so it's going to have a little bit bigger angle. In our model, we assume that the vertebra below C2, uh, below C2 are the same height, and the discs are the same height, so those will have the exact same angle. Now, we don't know if that's true or not until we look at the data, but that's what our model assumptions are based on. Okay, so table two from our project. This is the entire group, 400 subjects. Here's what we find. Highlighted are the mean values from our entire 400 population, uh, subject population. Here's our mean age, 35. Here's the average height to length index. The Delmas ideal was 95%, but our average subject had 96.98. Uh, you could round that up to 97% height over length index, a little bit larger than the Delmas index. Now maybe that's because the Delmas index is too deep of a curve, or maybe it's because there's no such thing as a perfectly normal, healthy subject. We still don't know the answer to that. Okay, so. Back to this, the atlas plane line, the average data was 24 degrees. Anterior head translation, the average subject had 15 millimeters of anterior head translation. Total angle of curve, C2 to C7, 34 degrees, the ARA. C2 to C3, 7.8. C3, C4, 6.6, I'm rounding up. C4, C5, 7.2. C5, C6, 5.9. C6, C7, 6.6. .6. Now if you look, we right away can understand our assumptions appear to be pretty damn close with our model. Now these are hand-drawn measurements, not the model prediction that I've just went through with you in this first column. But look, C2 is bigger than the rest of the segmental angles. And below C2, C3, these are, are really close to the same. Now you might say, well, indeed, they're not the same. And I'm gonna say they're pretty damn close to the same. If you take the number 6.5 degrees, plus or minus 0.7 degrees, it covers C3 to C7. It covers those angles. You have to realize how tight this data is you know, bunched together. The only outlier is actually the C2, C3 segment. And then shown here is the standard deviation that I don't wanna get into. What I do want to do is show you the model prediction. So our model predictions, our model predicts that for these people, ideally in our model, you would have a 96.73% height over length ratio. That would give me a 23 degree atlas plane line. 
That would give me a 34 degree ARA. That would give me C2, C3, 7.5 degrees, and then every segment below that is 6.6, .6, okay? Now this is our model predictions. Now what we do is we compare the data in the, this model prediction column to the data over here in this mean column. And then what we do is we look how close these two are aligned. 33.99, the model predicts 34. I'll tell you what, that's spot on, right? There's really 0% error there. I mean, there's a tiny error, but we rounded it to zero. The C2, C3, how close does our model using 40% larger for C2 approximate the actual data? A 3.7% error. How close does it approximate the rest of the segmental values? Look at this, 0.5%, 8.5, 10.7, and 0.5. Now the only outlier appears to be this C5, C6 level, 10.7%, okay? So I look at that and I go, whoa, 5.9 model predicts 6.6. .6. You could say 10.7%, that's a little bit high, but still you gotta realize this, that's really damn close from a math modeling perspective. A 10% error is a benchmark in mathematics. That means you got an A minus, folks, right? And the reality of it is this. We didn't make the damn spine, we're just modeling it, right? People look at that and you go, oh, way off. Really, 10.7%? Would you really get upset if you got a 90% on your calculus test? Would you go home and cry about it or would you go out and have a beer? That's the reality of it, right? Also, what you have to realize is this. C5 to C6 is likely an area that's highly degenerated in people's necks, even when they have a curve. That's where a lot of the load is acting. So it could be possible that the examiners had a higher uh, uh, degree of error in making that measurement there. And in fact, when you talked with the, the statistician when we presented the data, because more than one subject did these measurements, uh, so we did more repeated measures, uh, you'll find out that the examiners had a harder time making that measurement. So there's a little bit you know, of skew at that level simply maybe because of the de degeneration or maybe it is truly a little bit different at that level, right? Still 10.7%. Now that's all the subjects, 400 subjects. This is men versus women. Now this is another issue of concern. Does gender dictate the amount of cervical curve you should have? Now, at first, people would say, oh, well, yeah, it totally does, right? But when you really look at it logically, should a woman, compared to a man, have different sagittal plane curvatures? Do they really have different loads acting on their spine? Do they walk different under gravity? Do they have different gravitational loads acting on them? Do they have truly different anatomy in the neck? You know, when you break it down, it doesn't make sense. We have the same ligaments, the muscles, the discs, the bones. We have similar attachments. The difference is the body mass index and the physical size and the density. It doesn't mean that their curves should be different. However, we have to investigate that. So what we look at is we go right to the 90 or height over length index. We go 96.95 for men, 97.02 for women. Really, really close. Atlas plane line, 23 to 25, right? No statistically significant difference there. Translation, 15.3, 15.5. Cervical curve, 34.3, 33.5. By and large, there's very little differences between the men and the women. And in fact, it's not statistically significantly different except at a couple of the levels. Okay? A couple of the levels achieved a statistically significant difference, and I misspoke. Um, at the Atlas plane line, I said it wasn't, but it did show a statistically significant difference, but only you know, a, a degree and a half, and then also C2, C3, and C3, C4. But by and large, what you can see is there's no overt gender differences. Okay? And likely speaking, this has to do with a body mass uh, difference in terms of the way the mass is distributed between a man and a woman. There's different uh, maybe thoracolumbar effects and that might translate into the neck. But they're not overt differences in this project, which is important to note. This is really one of the largest samples that, that has ever been done looking at neck curves in men versus women. And then table four. This is an interesting table. 
We looked at 400 subjects in table two, we looked at men and women in table three, and now we have 83 subjects in the Delmas index range. So this is a subset of 83 people out of the 400. These are subjects that fit the Delmas range of 0 0.94 to 0.96, okay? We looked at this because we, we wanted to say, well, let's identify subjects that classically are within this range for the Delmas index because the Delmas index may still hold true. Let's see what their curves are and let's see what their percent error is compared to our model. So these 83 subjects had a mean curve of 43.7 degrees. Why? Well, they had a mean height to length index of 95%. They had a mean C2 to C3 angle of 10, C3, C4, eight, then nine, then eight, and then seven. And then you come over to the model. Here's what the model predicted. And then here's the percent error. Now you'll notice the percent error is just a little bit higher in the Delmas index subjects of interest. This might mean that this is a little too curved for the average subject. So our model has just a little bit higher percent error. However, still only one value C4, C5 this time, still in that area that has most of the de degeneration in the mid and lower neck, that has the 12% error. The mean error of this is still under 10%, but just a little bit higher for table four in terms of the model predicted error compared to what the actual subjects had. Table six, this is a very important table. This is similar to the Delmas index of separating uh, a subgroup of people out. This one, what we've done is we've said, only subjects that have a relative rotation angle between one and 11 degrees can be in this table. If you have a relative rotation angle that's above 11, that means 12 degrees or more of extension, you cannot be in this table. This is an instability criteria. We know from biomechanics literature and cervical kinematic literature that subjects that have 12 degrees or more for an extension at any segment in their neck, that is suggestive of static and dynamic instability. Your neck is not supposed to extend that much at each joint. So what we said is we said, well, let's identify a subset of this 400 uh, group population that fits within one to 11 degrees and let's look at their curves. This is quite fascinating, by the way. Their height to length index was a little straighter, 97.82%. Their total curve was a little bit less. Instead of 34 degrees, C2 to C7 is now 28.7. C2, C3 is still the biggest one, 6.3 degrees. And if I go down, look how close these segmental angles are to each other. C3 to C7 are extremely close to one another. They're, they're within a half a degree or so of each other, right? I go over to the model prediction and this will blow you away. The model prediction is spot on. There's no error for the C2 to C7 angle. There's 1% error for the C2 to C3, 3.6%, 2.3%, and lo and behold, we got that C5 to C6% to drop down below 10, it's now 7.3. The average error is under 5% from our model to what we measured with these subjects. This might in fact be a proper normal group. These subjects likely have no degeneration, they have no instability, and this is likely why their mid-cervical spine can be measured accurately, right, from the examiner. I really like this table, 29 degrees. Still, it's a, a circular segment if you look at how close the model is to the, this normal data. And then for all you symptopractors out there that like symptoms, what we did is we excluded 148 of the subjects that had uh, cranial cervical symptoms or scapular symptoms and we threw them out of this table. We were left with 252 subjects and we look at their total angle of curve compared to the model prediction and their segmental angle of curve compared to the model prediction. And you'll notice they, they're approximately the same as the whole group, right? It's a large sample, that's probably why, 252 out of the 400. But if you look, symptoms actually lessen the percent error of our model as well. 
all these values drop below 10%. So maybe there is something about lack of symptoms in a cervical curve that is circular. When you look at this model prediction, prediction C2 is spot on. C3, C4 is really, really damn close. Uh, C4, C5, and C5, C6 are the highest ones, but still under 10%. And then C6, C7 is a 1.4% error. Overall, what does this data indicate? Well, it indicates this. In lordotic necks, we were able to approximate their segmental and total curves with a cervical model. The model predictions came out extremely close to the hand-drawn measurements. Very little, if any, gender influences. And then we, we have a symptomatic population, or excuse me, an asymptomatic normal population, and then we have a, a couple different defined populations of normal, the instability um, table, and then or lack thereof, and then the Delmas index table. In the end, what does it mean? Well, here's what I would suggest to you this paper means. There truly can only be one ideal for the cervical curve. However, there's going to be a within normal limits. Within normal limits is likely somewhere between the top three here. So my top three on the, starting from the left is likely going to be considered within normal limits. However, straight necks and different types of kyphotic necks based on what we've identified in this paper, excuse me, are truly abnormal. And it's because in normal subjects, they should have a cervical lordosis and we can model it with a piece of a circle. It should be a uniform rate of curvature. C2 is approximately a degree bigger than the rest of the cervical vertebra and that's due to the size of the vertebral body. This is important data. Uh, here's what we've done with this particular project. Uh, we've chosen to use in this data set, we've chosen to use the 252 asymptomatic subjects to give you the, these values shown here. So we have a 97% height over length index. We have a 24 degree atlas plane line. And then we have uh, C2 is a little bit bigger than the rest of the cervical segments. Uh, total angle curve, 34 degrees. Head translation, 15 millimeters. And then over here, we have the quote unquote ideal Delmas index of 95%. And this is based on our idealized Fortran equation model. Now we still don't know today, is ideal really ideal? What we know is that below a certain range, there are consequences and there are problems. And we'll talk to you about that later on. However, we're confident that this can be used as normative data. It's one of the large, largest sample populations ever done on the cervical spine in true lordotic neck specimens. It's a very well done project for its time and for what the data uh, could provide and give us. The other thing that this particular project really uh, you know, screams out, and people often forget about this, is the fact that certain curves are extremely abnormal and you have to be able to spot those right away. Oftentimes, when you look at radiology reports or other doctor reports, you'll see an overtly abnormal cervical curve and it's classified and qualified as normal. They didn't accurately put measurements on it. You have to make segmental measurement angles, not just the total angle of curve. For example, in this paper, 1996, here's one of our figures. Specifically, look at B. B, the ARA is 40 degrees. And if I just did B, you would say, oh, see the ARA is 40 degrees. It's on the upper end of, of normal for these asymptomatic subjects. It's happy day, right? Wrong. All the angle is coming from one disk space, right? All the angle is coming from one disk space. This is not a smooth circular column. Our data from 1996 says that normal subjects can be approximated by a piece of a circle. Each segment has approximately the same angle of curve below C2, C3. The, these three examples are clearly abnormal. And some people go, oh, well, I've never seen B before. It doesn't exist in the population, really. Let me show you a little girl that fell off of the monkey bars and landed on her head. And she was cleared as normal at the hospital. I'm not going to say which hospital, you know, we don't need to do that here, but I can tell you she was cleared as normal. No fractures, right? 
and she's just fine. Well, later on, really bad neck pain, really bad headaches going on, and a little bit of hand numbness and tingling. Lo and behold, you take an x-ray, what do you see? You see C3, C4 is contributing the entire amount to the total curve. If you just you know, do a total angle of curve, you go, oh, it's within normal limits. But when you actually look at it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that C3, C4 is well beyond 11 degrees. It's an unstable segment. It's got a retrolisthesis. This is a serious injury. And this is a serious application for our particular paper. You can spot these things right away and you can say, hey, this is truly abnormal. We need to get a much smoother you know, amount of, or alignment in that curve and we need to reduce that C3 to C, uh, C4 angle. Hopefully you, li hopefully you like that uh, project, 1996 spine. I would strongly, strongly encourage everybody out there to read that paper in detail for yourself. That way you can truly identify, hey, is this really a legitimate paper? Is this a normative data set that I really want to hang my hat on and compare my uh, patient populations to? If you like this project and you like these videos, I'm going to ask you again to please consider supporting Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit. We need membership. We need the members to pay their dues. This is how we do research projects like this. Research is time, effort, energy, but also monetary consuming. And the way you can help out there is by contributing financially to CBP Nonprofit and help us spearhead new cutting edge research projects and you know, test uh, older projects like this as well. We're, we're still improving our methods as well as advancing our methods, right? So please continue to support us or consider supporting us, either directly through donations at the web link or indirectly through Amazon Smile. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll talk to you next week.